wait to start. And now jump in. Okay, well, you go get some food. Stream at five o'clock. That's when normal people eat, isn't it? Well, <laughs> maybe that, we're that not normal people. Presupposes it's actually five o'clock. Hey, well, that's also true. <laughs> it's eleven a.m. over here. <clears throat> no, Anglo meantime. Right. Well, on that note, hello everyone. Welcome to the second episode of the Magnum Opi podcast. Um, this week we are going to be looking at Lord of the Flies. So I'll just do some introductions for anyone that isn't currently eating. Um, so I'm the Albion. With me, I've mean. got Brandig. Good morning from the States. I've got the bloke. Good not morning from England. I've got uh, Quackhouse, if he can finish yeah, his mouthful. Tea time, tea time in the UK. <laughs> uh, freelance Bishop. Uh, dinner time in the Netherlands. <laughs> and Justine. Tea time in the UK and it's already dark. Right. Well, after our dinner conversation, um, let's take a look at... So, we've got uh, Lord of the Flies this week, <clears throat> published in 1954. Um, let's just get stuck in um, and <laughs> see what people think. So, who wants to give a brief summary of the book? I can go if you want. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> a group of boys get stranded on a, uh, a deserted island. Uh, it starts to go quite well at the beginning. And, uh, you know, they set up a, a bit of a, a, what would you call it? A parliament or something. And then they slowly devolve into anarchy and then shortly followed by dictatorship. And then, yeah. You're savagery. Yeah, totally wrong. Savagery. Tribalism. Tribalism, yeah. Yes group of kids wash up on a beach, try to establish society, and it fails, I think is the most simplified version we can get to. So there's a power struggle between two leaders from the very beginning, you can see the seeds of it. Um, Ralph and Jack. Sorry, I was just typing. Yes. Um, let's let's dive in. So we've got uh, first off, as we did before, we're going to take a look at the author. <clears throat> so here, William Golding. I've put a quote there that I think sums up his kind of mentality when it comes to the main themes of the book. He very much has a view of life, a, a tragic view of human nature. And I think this was mainly inspired by his time serving in uh, the Navy during World War II. When he came back, he, he was an English teacher for a little while, um, which kind of gets onto the influences. So there was very famous at the time, there was a book called The Coral Island. Main cast were Ralph, Jack, and Peter. The main three in Lord of the Flies, we have Ralph, Jack and Piggy. Um, it's heavily inspired, and I think it, he just wanted to give a little bit of a twist on, on what he thought would accurately happen. In the Coral Island, it was three boys that end up uh, marooned on an island, and they spread their Christian values um, amongst a group of savages, um, and everything goes hunky-dory until they're found. Obviously, in Lord of the Flies, not a little, little bit of a different uh, view of what's going to happen. <clears throat> I've also just put on the influences, uh, the line, the witch and the wardrobe. That's not because I am a hundred percent certain that he's read it. Although being an English teacher in the fifties, I'd be very surprised if he didn't, uh, but it's the, the text is an allegorical, uh, book. So very much the, the story is subservient to the main, uh, themes of the book as opposed to the other way around. Um, Anyone want to touch on any other any comments that they've got or any other influences I can think of with the book? Was it people's first time reading it? It was. It was mine, yeah. Um, when it came to GCSE books, we did different ones. And other than that, I've never touched on it. <laughs> I hadn't read it uh, since 
20 years ago when I was in uh, elementary school and uh, forgot uh, a good bit of the, the latter part of the book. It's uh, something I've been meaning to read for a long time. And I, I was sure I'd seen a film version at some point, but um, it might just be the sort of uh, things that it has influenced that I might have seen. Yeah, to me, it's a book that a lot of people have heard of, but that a lot of people kind of skip over because they, they know what it's about, but they don't really see a need to, to go back to it. But I definitely think it's worth yeah. reading. Uh, yeah, we can hear you, Justine. Um, so, yeah, just on to what it did influence. So what it left behind... It's a bit of a, <laughs> a damning comparison when you look at uh, what it was inspired by and the text that it <laughs> came from to what's now been left behind. So a lot of people will first have experienced anything similar to it through the Simpsons episode. Uh, I think it's Das Bus, um, which actually might be out of the two films and the episode might be my favorite interpretation of it. Um, the other the other main uh, text that it's influenced, obviously, the Hunger Games, that was mainly uh, influenced by Battle Royale, but you can see aspects of Lord of the Flies in there. The other thing I put on there was a film called Lady World, which originally started out as a script for Lord of the Flies um, and then ended up coming out as this masterpiece, as you can see. Yeah. So I, I actually... Yeah, it, seems to, it seems to have won a lot of awards, so it can't be bad, right? <laughs> yeah, I suffered through watching the trailer, and it's about as good as you can imagine. What, oh, what, well, is, that, what is that top girl doing, by the way? Because like... <laughs> It looks like she's filleting some hair, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, but it gets 3 out 3.4 out of 10 on IMDb, which well, is... Uh, all That's girl a mark of quality of ever I've seen it. I'm going to watch it uh, later now. So it's interesting. <laughs> is it the, the sequel to uh, Cuties? <laughs> <laughs> Prequel. <Yeah. laughs> uh, <laughs> moving on swiftly from that comment. Um, right, so um, we've, we've gone into a very, very brief summary of what the book's about. So what I want to do to get a proper analysis of it, we're going to look at each character individually and get a proper feel for uh, who they are and what they represent. Like I say, it's an allegorical text. So Golding was very much trying to send a message through this work, not just the actual story that's shown, uh, but through the, um, through the perspective of the reader, he wants to tell a larger story. Yep. So let's start off with our protagonist of sorts, Ralph. Who wants to start us off? Hey, he's not blonde. <laughs> yeah, well, he's not blonde, and Jack isn't isn't a ginger. So you know, right. the film adaptation is took some liberties. I'd say, I'd say Jack's uh, gingerness is probably yeah, deeply connected to his role. <laughs> now, yeah. now, in my opinion, <laughs> could I describe Ralph? I think I think yeah, Ralph, yeah. I think Ralph is like a a the most natural leader. Um, he's associated, he, he references his father, who is, um, I think he's in the military, right? Yes, yeah. Um, he has like an innate sort of sense of honor. Um, he's a little bit offhand, you know, initially um, with, say, Piggy, who's a more sensitive member, but, you know, he's the one who represents civilization um, and, you know, the, the natural leader, I think, in this. Yeah, but he's not—he's he's a good leader during good times. So when things need to be discussed and when things are going well, he's the kind of guy you want because he will uh, basically complain about when something's going wrong, but he won't actually force you anything. But as soon as a crisis hits, then you will see that things go go wrong because he does, just doesn't step up, which we see in the story. He does fail. Well, one of the things that I think uh, that that came to me since the last time we spoke about this was he seems to be a consummate politician in that he's a very good figurehead and he he's charismatic, but he's not good at actually making decisions or coming up with plans that work. Yes. Yeah. I think that on face value and when being younger, when I first read it, I think that you look at Ralph and he, he looks like, an ideal leader you think that he's kind of got all of those qualities that would make him a good leader but when you 
looking at him now, you realize that he's he's someone that's got natural qualities that just make a good leader. He is he's one of those people that's just born to lead, but doesn't actually want to embrace that role. <clears throat> he never really expresses any interest in the group. Um, he he finds his enjoyment through being alone on adventures. Um, yeah, I'd say he gets he get he's more like he gets pushed along by everyone else. Exactly. Like he, he he wouldn't yeah. take a single decision in the entire book if not pressed by. Uh, circumstances and people. I think it, if yeah. he hadn't been there to like start him off, he probably would have just fallen in line behind uh, Jack at the start. He, I, I like the part where he says, "My father has a map, and there's a picture of this island. The Queen has a map, yeah, of this of the with, whole with this world. island on it. Yeah, yeah. And this <laughs> island is on it. So he's quite confident that if he just sets up a fire, which you know he's actually ultimately right, <laughs> that they that they will be rescued." Yeah, so the, the main conflicts we have when Ralph and Piggy are on the beach, um, Ralph, well, Piggy finds the conch, but it's, it's then handed to Ralph. <clears throat> and this conch imbues his leadership. It's a physical manifestation of his leadership, essentially. And everyone that sees that uh, recognizes that he then holds the power. And it's used to then transfer power between people by giving the conch to different people. Um, I just wanted to make sure that as we go along, for anyone that hasn't read it, we, we do give uh, a little bit of plot detail just so that we don't go completely off the rails and people don't know what they're talking about. But I do encourage everyone that's listening to read the book before you listen. So <clears throat> but I, just making sure that people are on the same track. Definitely worth a read. Yes. Yeah, it's a smooth read. It's so, quite enjoyable. <laughs> I, so, carry on, Justine. Oh, just uh, expanding on your reference to allegory. I, I think this is a very successful allegory in that it does work on more than one level and that it's not one of these sort of, um, you know, stiff allegories where you're always looking for the the symbolic level or the, or the other level. You know, it does work as a story as well. So it's realistic enough to draw you in as a story, but it also clearly points to another level of meaning. Exactly. Yeah, I think it, in my eyes, it's one of the best in, in, in its field for for having more than its some of it, more than the sum of its parts. It, it's more than just a story. It, it, it appears to be on, on the surface level, uh, even though it works as that. And I think a lot of allegorical stories can can aim for something higher, but they fail at the the base level. Mm -hmm. so, As a narrative. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think the best the, the best things like um, have something for everyone, you know, at every level of analysis. Yes. So, you know, you take it, it's very base one right down. Yeah. And to go back to Golding, like I say, he was an English teacher and he was also a philosophy teacher as well. Um, so you can really, you can tell you know, mm -hmm. his influences come through a lot in, in what he's written because he, everything's on point. The other thing to, to mention about him, everything in my eyes is described so concisely it, it, it could be a book of, you know, a thousand pages with the thing that go with everything that happens in it, but everything is so on point and just net and refined. I, I, I think it's written fantastically and it's so just yeah, the, the descriptions as well mm -hmm. have fit really in the, the perspective of the children that are on the Island. Cause everything is yeah. a little bit overly colorful. Everything's described as popping mm -hmm. a little bit too much, but <laughs> through the eyes of a child, that makes sense. There are a few but instances just... where, where he describes things like soil condition or that the uh, the castle will turn into an island in a couple of centuries, things like that, which children couldn't have mm -hmm. seen. So sometimes he, he slightly moves out of that, but that's probably to describe uh, the situation a bit more to the reader. Yes. Uh, yeah. but, but overall, yeah, it's, it's someone typing. Isolate. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he describes things like uh, like the way they would see it, like things like dark shadows and, and uh, the way the light falls and, and not, not too, too much in an adult language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. If, and, and, and in a way that if you didn't understand, then you would see shadows and, you know, if you didn't understand what you were seeing, you see, you see something else, if you know what I mean, if you, if you, if you know what you're seeing, yeah. you see the thing, but yeah. Well, perception <clears throat> is one of the great themes of the novel. What was that perception? Perception, yeah, because yes, the yeah. children 
they're too young to, they don't have any adults to interpret the world for them. So they're, you know, everything is, uh, they have to do it themselves. And of course you have to kind of guess what it is that's being described, you know, like the best yes. effect is with the, the beast, right? Like, which turns out to be a dead parachute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that, that, that theme of, per of perception is so prevalent throughout it. But I think that um, on top of that, it goes a step further, which is that um, even through perception, regardless of whether or not it's correct or not, it's basically establishing their own reality on the island. Um, so it's not just whether or not they perceive it, it's that their entire worldview is then formed by the perceptions that they make um, on this island. So it kind of takes on a characteristic where even if what they're looking at even if what they perceive is incorrect, it doesn't really matter uh, at, a, at a level because that has now become their entire reality. Like with the beast, when it gets to a yeah. certain level, you can interpret something. And even if it's incorrect, because you've embodied that uh, and, and, and the, the shadow has embodied that beast, it no longer matters if it's real or not. Does that make sense? it has real consequences as, yes. for, you know, in terms of uh, Simon becoming the beast for them. Yes. So just carrying on, on with Ralph, does anyone else have anything to say on Ralph and what they think of him? Who yeah, actually like likes his... Ralph as a character? I, I, I like Ralph. I think it's easy. Yeah, I think, yeah. Carry on, Quackers. I was going to say that, yeah, particularly at the start, there's like this tug of war with the trying to, with them being children and them doing what they think an adult, you know, an Englishman, as they put it, should do. So like, um, and particularly with Ralph at the start, you know, there's a lot of, he does, a, he keeps doing these handstands for some bizarre reason and they keep reverting to the childhood ways. And then all of a sudden, like they have to kind of, you know, push themselves to drag themselves back, you know, to, to you know, to, to be able to get through with the thing that they're going through. And it, it's kind of, at the start, it's there, you know, the, 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 the tug of war. And then as it goes through, the, the adult bit kind of wins over and then towards the end it kind of it kind of flips back but it yeah I don't, I don't know if I'm not really he, he, he starts out like a free man and then then first thing he does is, is meet Biggie which basically trusts society upon him uh, and then they find a conch and then he becomes a leader and Jack Jack appears and then you get his power struggle and in the beginning they're cooperating nicely but then you see that because he's not really an effective leader, Jack takes over, and he more, he also says that more and more he, he feels that he's losing himself. He's becoming more and more savage. He feels it himself. Well, and Ralph, yeah. Ralph never seems to me to be a very well fleshed out or or solid character. He seems to mostly be a go along, get along kind of person who who's there for the ride and not really willing to take control. Or uh, or drive things in any yeah, say like he, way. he's driven by the events and the other characters. Yeah, he's and, very reactive, well, not proactive. Yeah, but he also wants to be safe. So is he also the one who's really focused on the fire and the smoke? So that's uh, not really. I mean, it, it in a second, it, it, only in secondarily, he seems to be more than happy to leave that to his father, and and he trusts his father is going to save him anyway. Yeah, but part, do you want to cover the, the smoke just to to just, you know, just try to keep the fire going? Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea is that they they uh, keep a signal fire going that produces mm -hmm. smoke, so ships will see that and pick them up. Uh, and this fire that takes organization and effort to maintain, and they discover that they they can't do this. So it's um, it's kind of symbolic of of society that some parts of society require upkeep and uh, they fail that because they're kids. And, well, it's not um, that they can't do it because they've proven that they actually can in the early part of the book. It's that they choose not to do it. They don't prioritize it. They get distracted yeah. and, and move on to other things. No, they choose, they choose to hunt over keeping the fire up and that's, that's part of the conflict. Yeah, yeah well, like, the other thing is it's either the, the fire can be interpreted a few ways, but if you're looking at it as either hope or a hope to return to civilization, um, they're prioritizing the hunt over the fire is essentially them prioritizing savagery over re a return to civilization. Um, or, it's them or, or meet over, uh, over a possible return to civilization. Yes, yeah. 
It's them like putting the their base needs first over anything higher. And, and that, that later on turns into safety over civilization because then Jack promises that they, they will provide meat and safety uh, yes. by, by trying to appease the beast. And, yeah, uh, he basically takes the bread and circuses line. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I interrupted you, uh, Crackers. I know. I was just saying, yeah, the smoke stack. You know, if you saw that the smoke stack as civil, like the smoke signal as civilization, like it takes, you know, what it takes to keep civilization going, you know, is is basically what it takes to keep the fire going and the smoke. Yes, you've got to sacrifice. <laughs> to keep yeah, it so going. it's yeah, yeah, and and organize it. You know, it takes sacrifice and organization and actual skills and you know these different things which they have, but only. I don't know, in short bursts, and then it, it, it quickly deteriorates. Mm -hmm. if, if nobody's there to keep prodding at it to make it happen, which Ralph isn't, you know, he, he kind of gives, uh, yeah, he gives these people the, their jobs to do and then, but doesn't make sure they carry on doing it. It's like uh, the, you know, the, the people need constant prodding in order to keep them doing what the thing that they, they should be doing. And they, yeah. And that's one of the things that struck me about this was, uh, um, and it's kind of jumping to the end, but the 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 whole overall poor showing, as it were, of the boys across the entire book is a complete and total demonstration of their lack of education or upbringing or uh, values being instilled in them while they're young to actually think ahead and plan and be willing to look to the future rather than, you know, focusing on the short time horizon of what are we going to do today and what are we going to do, you know, uh, tonight rather than mm -hmm. what are we going to do next week? Yeah. And, and the, there's like most of the, the children in it that where it's mentioned, they've either got an absent father figure or no father figure as well, which kind of adds to that. Not, not them not having the tools that they need necessarily. Yeah, they've, they've been socialized through school, so we see vestiges of you know their their school uniforms, their school structures, like choir. You know, but it's only a veneer, as we soon find out. Mm -hmm. So that it, it being, literally falls off over time. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let, let's uh, let's go on to Jack, <clears throat> as we're on that subject. Not so, what do, what do we think of Jack? I think this is going to have the most uh, disagreements or <laughs> well, he, sa he, says, he, says it, he says at some time, like, he's glad that there are more rules because then he can enforce, enforce them because everybody who disobeys them will get whacked. So he likes to control other people. That's what I get from him. Jack's a cop. He's, he's definitely bloodthirsty. <laughs> yeah, I think that Jack is, um, again, with, with, with a, a very baseline reading of it you could see him as the villain of the piece but i think that there's there's a lot of there's a lot a lot of characteristics of jack which are quite admirable and he is very intelligent and he knows how to manipulate people he becomes a bit of a populist in the end because he's by just offering food uh, to get people to, to go to his side um but again he, he doesn't know how to how to rule effectively um and he mm. obviously he's he's most interesting for the fact that he is the only one that comes onto the island with a pre-established hierarchy in his in the form of his choir mm -hmm. um, they all land together they've already got an established set of rules with him at the top so you would imagine he would naturally be the person to take to take leadership if he's already got a group um, backing his his claim uh, but that's where the the conch is demonstrated as is holding this you know innate power and is a is a manifestation of of, of being of, of leadership or of you know civilization whatever you want to angle you want to take well he's the strongest leader in the book um it's just he's not he doesn't have the uh, um the long time horizon or the, the 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 perspective to look forward he's focused on the now Mm -hmm. But his leadership style is effective. Um, but I was going to say, he, even right at the start, you get a glimpse of what kind of leader to his choir group that he might have been, considering none of them will vote for him, and that they all seem to be, yeah, a bit wary yes. of him. Yes, that is a good point. Uh, when when they when they first carry out a, a, a 
a vote to decide the leader of, of, of the kids. Um, everyone goes for Ralph, even all of the choir. So it does make you wonder what kind of leadership skills he had off of the island if if they not a single person was willing to, to vote for Jack. Well, one can be a he strong make- leader and not a good leader. That's, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and I think that the issue might be that he is a good leader in a in a time of war or in a time of time of hardship, um, whereas Ralph's kind of lackadaisical approach might be might be good leadership in 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 the easy times, but not not in this island environment. Yeah, I mean, some of the first things he does is make fun of um, Simon, isn't it? He mocks mocks him and. Yes, yes. very nice win. And Piggy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. What were you well, going to say, freelance? Though? Well, if 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 you compare him to uh, to Ralph, Ralph is, is seems to be if he's concerned with anything, it's it's he's concerned with the fire. So it's all long term goals, and it's uh, and, he, and and Jack is really focused on the short term goals. He's happy being a hunter. He's happy to provide for food and safety, which are really short term goals, mm-hmm. and he pr- prioritizes that. Uh, that's also the because. All the children also have those those needs. He fulfills that. But if you blame him for anything, he is the one who enables other children to be really cruel. So he's not a, a just leader. And uh, they lose quite a few of their number as a result, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A number that we don't actually know. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the little ones are never actually accounted for. <laughs> they, there's just small yeah. children wandering around it could be dozens dead it could be what three um but we'll never know because they don't even prioritize uh, doing a head count of, of the children it could be that it's just some kid washed his face and that some mulberry stain disappeared so we don't know <laughs> yeah yeah. <clears throat> yeah we'll touch on the mulberry uh scarred child in a moment so yeah do, does everyone agree that jack is a better leader than ralph um, he's a better well, manager, but uh, I wouldn't say that he's a better leader. <laughs> well, it's, he, has it's hard of, uh, qu- he has a kind of quasi-religious bread and circus approach to to leadership. You know, he gets them their meat, he does the little tribal dancing and takes them hunting, mm-hmm. and uh, but then he, he's starting to sort of build up. It feels like a kind of tribalistic religion, you know, with the uh, when he plants the what what becomes the lord of the flies in the mm-hmm. ground that mm-hmm. the pig's head to to appease the beast he's sort of building up a mythos around himself um but you don't, you don't kind, kind of, of, of fear. well it's kind of hard to be a worse leader than ralph <laughs> <laughs> you see your your view on on ralph seems to have uh hard as would <laughs> <laughs> well it's upon further reflection i mean it's the about the worst thing one can do as a leader is to establish goals and rules uh, and and plans and then make absolutely no effort whatsoever to enforce them or make them happen or translate them into action which it's is exactly what Ralph does that's, he's surprised that's... that no one builds the huts but he doesn't do anything when they don't build the huts apart from mm-hmm. having a little moan for a couple of seconds yeah there's yeah, no it, incentives it, it, if yeah, the leader doesn't imagine. actually enforce consequences <laughs> for failure to follow, then they're not a leader. I don't. I don't even know what word I'd use to describe them in that case. Mm-hmm. No. I mean, Jack's hunting Jack. skills definitely. Uh, you know, there's something to be said for that. The fact that he gets out and kills those pig, that, those pigs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's something that he has to work at as well, isn't it? He, he's not instantly yeah. good at it, but he knows, you know, he knows he's got it in himself to do it, which is, you know, why he goes. He really had to find that ability. You know, yeah. he he started off with his like couldn't even couldn't even stab a, a pig that they had like held down, and then he he becomes like the sort of basically the the hunter on the island, doesn't he? There are other people yeah. hunting, but he seems like he's like the main hunter. Yeah, and it goes one step above that, which I think someone mentioned before, where not only is he <clears throat> embodying the hunter, he then starts putting in rituals for the group to follow, uh, which further their commitment to the group, or, or it, it reinforces their uh, loyalty to the group, because they're going through rituals that are put in place by him. Singing and dancing. Yes, yeah. And it's something that we, we mentioned before. It's one of those one of those books that, Although it's impossible because there's no girls on the island, 
That is what it's a tribe <laughs> that it would be. It would be really interesting to see three hundred years down the line the society that's built because all of these little cues that, that are being put in place now and all of these um, rituals. It'd be it'd be a very interesting look to to see how they develop. Um, <laughs> You got to guess Sorry, that Karen. someone like Jack, though, would only be able to stay in power as long as someone stronger didn't come along. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's 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 not he's held in place by the fact that he's he's there's the fear element. You know, people are, are frightened of him, and he's also you know, he's and a- the fact that he can provide this food. You know, if if for whatever reason he couldn't provide the food for any period of time, then he would just lose his grip. Or you know, if someone stronger or a, a couple of you know, slightly less strong, but together stronger people came along. They could overthrow Jack. You know, he's he's, he's mm-hmm. he wouldn't be held in place the same way Ralph would have been had Jack not been there. You know what I mean? If the, if the, that strong person hadn't been there, <laughs> girls don't enter into it not only because they're not there, but because the boys are so young. But it, you know, so you can sort of exclude like thinking about oh well, what would happen if you know? It's kind of not even yeah. in there. Yeah, it's it's a criticism that's been labelled against the book that there's no women in it, um, which is something that I was going to touch on later on when we get to the critical responses, but we'll we'll cover it now. It's to me, it's one of the most ridiculous criticisms you can have of a book where you're literally <clears throat> criticising its entire premise. It's like criticising the film Zulu because there's not enough Japanese people in the British army. Well, like, are, are, it's literally what the story's about. Are these critics feminists, or is this an actual criticism? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I like how you differentiate yeah. feminists and people. <laughs> um, Activists. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've heard, uh, you know, I've heard it from both sides. But uh, William Golding actually addresses it himself. There, there's a, a two minutes or three minute video where he does a brief introduction to <clears throat> Lord of the Flies, and he says that he doesn't, he doesn't want sex to be mentioned in the book because it could take up half the book if mm-hmm. they start if once you get down those lines he wanted it purely to be a distillation of of what would happen in society and, and his point was that if you want to have um, a representation of of society in a small unit or in a small group you're going to be you're going to display it better with a group of men than you would with a group of women because their interactions are more representative of a general society mm-hmm. I think as a school teacher, he probably was thinking, what would these kids be like if, you know, yes. five, you know without adults? Yeah, if I remember correctly, he, that's actually how it started. He turned to his wife and basically said, I want to write a book about how the boys would actually interact. I don't, I don't yeah. know if he went to an old boys school to teach. I, I would imagine so, but um, I'm not I'm not certainly certain. Yeah, well, as you said, you know, he was a boy. He taught boys. And therefore, you know, he never taught girls. I think he's what he says in that interview. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he, he's writing from his frame of reference. So. I mean, like I say, I don't think, I, I don't consider it a problem simply because the kids are so young. They're not, you know. Yeah. They're exactly. not wor- They're not thinking about girls or sex or m- missing anything, particularly except for their parents and aunties and things. No, and from start to finish, you don't even, it's not even something that to me is even noticeable because it's not even brought up. So it's not something that pops to mind. But anyway, is there anything else that any, anyone has to say on Jack? Or should we move on to the third of our trifecta? World. I just, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Uh, I did. I did some quick Wikipedia scholarship and uh, okay. found out that apparently he taught at Bishop's Wadsworth School in um, Salisbury, which I believe is yeah, boys aged eleven to eighteen. Yes, it is. Yeah. So, so there you go. Part, uh, yeah, I'm vaguely familiar with that school. Yeah. He has never seen a woman in his life, so he can't <laughs> write about it. Something like that. Okay, who wants to start on Piggy? And his smug little face in that picture. <laughs> what do people think of Piggy? Because I, well, I've definitely soured towards Piggy every time I've read it. <laughs> I, uh, He's the most self-sabotaging yeah. character in the whole book. <laughs> in, essentially in all of fiction. Yeah. I was sympathetic to him until I'd done this recent read. And uh, 
you know, maybe I, whenever I whenever I kind of had experienced Lord of the Flies in earlier in my life, I'd felt sympathy for Biggie, but now uh, kind of the opposite. Mm. <laughs> He's he very marks, much a bureaucrat. marks himself out as the victim mm -hmm. from the beginning by by unwisely telling Ralph uh, his nickname, right? <laughs> and then well, being you say unwisely, but I want I mm -hmm. it's, the way I read that is that he knows that he is the bottom of the of the ladder. So he just kind of gets it out of the way. Um, right, because okay, I, 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 it's almost like if I embody the fact that I am this pathetic weasel, <laughs> then then at least people know where I stand and they can I can I can be truthful from the start that but, but he that does say useless. don't tell anyone. He says don't tell anyone. Then he's then he feels betrayed when he you know, immediately refers to him as Piggy. <laughs> it's still, it's still he hangs around Ralph constantly. Yeah, yeah. Well, he starts out as a beaten man. I mean, that yes. they, and he doesn't get any higher. So, uh, he's, I think he's everyone has classic, come across someone the, like this. He's the classic sycophant. Yeah, he's the, uh, the he's the exact opposite of of Jack, where Jack actually comes into his element, being a savage on the island. Piggy uh, basically is is somebody who benefits a lot from society it's even because he wears glasses and without them he's even more useless than he is with them well i mean i don't know that there's any place that piggy actually has an element i mean he seems <laughs> to be the epitome of worthless mm -hmm. i mean he, is, there, uh... he, he possesses the intellect that he could be of value but he doesn't use it in any way that actually you know results in anything positive happening he needs an environment where that intellect can uh, can flourish and the, the island certainly isn't that because of the lack of resources well no it's it's there's plenty of stuff that he can do in the island that actually would you know improve their environment and he's the one that uh, uh i think he's the one that uh, suggests the fire and he yeah, suggests the organization and he finds the conch uh, Etc. So all of that, uh, all of that ability uh, is within his mind. He just doesn't actually make use of it, which makes him even more pathetic in my mind. Mm -hmm. We hear that he um, doesn't I mean, because he has asthma. He doesn't. Um, he says, you know, I've got asthma, so therefore I can't, you know, build the, sh uh, you know, shelter. And it, it's not clear whether he really can't or he just doesn't try. You know. Yes. If you come across someone and on the very first conversation you have with them, they tell you they're asthmatic <laughs> and that they have a, a nickname Piggy and that they're basically completely useless to you. And uh, that they can't any do anything because of their auntie. It, yes, exactly. I, I just think it, this is what I mean. He kind of tries to establish himself that he, he basically tries to tell them that he's useless um, from the get go. And I, <clears throat> I wonder if he knew that that Ralph was going to tell everyone that his name was Piggy because we never find out his real name. And he tells him the only name that he gives him from the start is Piggy. So it's kind of like the, I know that this is my lot in life, so I'll just get it over with. <laughs> Maybe his uh, his real nickname was much much worse, and he just thought he'd just pick a nickname, <laughs> which is like one he could live with, you know. <laughs> what do you think would have been his original nickname? <laughs> well, actually, it says in the book it could be worse. It could be Fatty. Oh yes, yeah, mm. yeah. That's very mm. true. <laughs> so, so, do you think he's like the the re he represents the intel the sort of intellectual class that would be executed by by the communists after the revolution kind of thing uh, that's actually almost what happens yeah mm -hmm. because i don't know i kind of feel like he would be peak bureaucrat though he, he's he's like the epitome of i don't know a midwit mid-level bureaucrat he's, he's I, even I, I, I that role because he has he's told he's told like uh, take a list of everybody who's here and then without yeah. paper and pen it's kind of hard and, and, yeah and then he completely utterly fails at it <laughs> yeah <laughs> which like leads to us not knowing how many <laughs> yeah which leads to us not knowing how many children actually end up dead so then it's full of excuses that makes him a perfect uh, government uh, civil servant yes <laughs> well the, the two points on that one i think when it when you mentioned the um would he be the first to, to get killed in a communist regime? I don't know. The glasses just make me think of, uh, was it Cambodia? 
Uh, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> Any intellectual <laughs> the uh... as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even notice that. Things, yeah, so. that's a good point. Um, Anyone with glasses got executed. Yeah. Yes, and the yeah. the other point to make was um, the, the I don't know if you know the concept of the spiteful, spiteful mutant, which is basically that he oh, yeah. he is so genetically maladapted that he he's actually happy when the group fails. When, when yeah, he's, um, more the, he's more of a beautiful one than a spiteful mutant. <laughs> well, he could be that as well, I suppose. Um, he doesn't do enough uh, self self pruning, but uh, he's happy when the group fails because when when they are uh, discussing building the fire, um, it's it's then that that the Mulberry Boy get gets killed, which we'll we'll touch on in a moment when we come to the minor characters. Um, and when when the fire spreads and the forest goes up in flames he he the the quote isn't in front of me but it's something like he laughed with such a cackle that everyone stopped and stared at him like he was he was so joyful in the fact that their plans have been ruined and that uh everything was going to hell what's um, the classic uh, misery loves company exactly welcome yeah. welcome to my world now <laughs> yeah now you know how it feels don't forget the last line of the book though the the death of the wise and and good yes, that's a good point. But is, that is hindsight, though. And it, I do wonder if that's uh, just him kind of retrospectively boosting up his perspective of Piggy. He, he, he wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart, the fall through the air of the true wise friend called Piggy. Well, Ralph recognizes that Piggy can think. He, he, can, he can think and reason, and that uh, Ralph can also do that to some extent, but he feels like he's losing that ability. Um, so uh, Piggy is the, the one that becomes least savage as it is, while all the kids go more and more savage and have longer hair and and um, get a tan in the sun. Piggy more or less remains the way that he is. He even remains fat, despite the fact that, that they'd probably be malnourished at some point. So, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's naturally uh, bold, almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so a way that, a way that uh, William Golding um, represents uh, the passage of time is through discussing their hair. Uh, and for every character, the way that they respond to the growth, the growth of their hair is kind of a, a, how, they, how they feel about their time on the island. You know, some of them, <clears throat> Roger, uh, who is naturally the most sadistic child on the island seems to grow into his hair and it's described as him being uh, basically um he's grown into it in such a way that it was almost like he always had it um like his savagery has grown on the island um with ralph his hair's growing and he doesn't like it he feels like he, he wants to get it cut he, he's noticing the fact that it's growing uh, much like his time on the island with piggy it's a it's a clear passage. I, I wish I had my my quotes <laughs> in front of me, but um, but it, yeah, it basically says that everyone changes apart from Piggy. He remains exactly the same. Uh, he is the only um, con constant on the island. But he loses his glasses lens by lens, basically. Why do you think yeah, he is the only constant on the island? Just as a out of curiosity. Well, it, it, I think Golding uses him as a touchstone for yeah. uh, the rest of the, the boys as to how much they've, they've lost and how far they've fallen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose in, he's the best one to compare it to because he's at the bottom anyway. <laughs> he's already at the bottom, so you can assess how, fa how far everyone else has fallen by how, <laughs> how close they are to getting to Piggy. But in terms of his values, though, his values kind of remain the same. Whereas, obviously, I yes, think yeah, you could say that about Jack. Uh, his values obviously don't stay the same. Yeah, it's not just physically that he never changes. It's also in his perspective of of what's to be done. And he, he's, he's 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 like even at the end, he's saying, you know, we're not savages. You know, we we shouldn't be behaving <laughs> yeah. this way. Yeah, I didn't say that exact. Word. That's not yeah, let's think, phrase, yeah, yeah let's. Let's use the quote on screen instead. Yeah, I, I've tried to pick out what best represents their character, and that, that basically sums them up. Um, and the two ways of looking at it are the fact that uh, 
it's either that that's his kind of ideal that he wants to live in a world of rules, but you could look at it in in his kind of self preservation way in which he knows that society and with with rules and where people agree are the only one he's gonna stick around in as opposed to a society in which they hunt and kill <clears throat> okay let's move on to Simon so I've put together Simon and the Lord of the Flies. Um, the interesting thing about the Lord of the Flies, so Beelzebub, I always used to think that it was just another name for Satan, uh, but it was actually a specific demon who causes destruction of civilizations through ty tyrants and causes false uh, causes demons to be worshipped falsely by men. So, you know, what what do you think uh, is being implied there? Is Beelzebub mentioned by name? Well, Lord of the Flies is a name for Beelzebub. Oh. I can't remember if he's in the book by name, but he is. So. It's all but it's all but said that that it's him. Yeah, in, in the in the use of Lord of the Flies. Yes, yeah. So, what what do we think of, of it being this specific demon? And what and what about Simon? Who wants to touch on Simon? Simon starts out as one of the choir boys, but he immediately starts connecting to Ralph. Uh, and But he also tends to wander off a lot. And, and I think the idea is that he has fits or, or has, has some epilepsy or something like that. Um, it, it also shows him as being on the edge of Jack's group from the offset as well, which could yeah. really mean you know, why he would be keen to you know, attach himself to a new group. He's presented as slight, sort of slightly mad or or perceived as slightly mad in a few different instances. He... Yeah, at the start, um, when he, you know, uh, was it Jack says, oh, he's always, always fainting or he's always, uh, what, I can't remember the exact wording now, but yeah, he, he's implying that he's useless, you know. And then at the start, when it's suggested that he's part of the uh, the scouting party, he's uh, you know Jack makes fun of it. Sorry, I was just Did digging around to see whether or not the name Beelzebub was mentioned. I don't think it is, but um, no, it, it, it was definitely uh, intentional. <clears throat> he he also uh, seems to embody uh, innocence from the mm -hmm. perspective of the author. You know the yeah the the trusting nature and, you know, the, the desire to, uh, support society. And, and it, he's, he's whatever tacit support and approval piggy can get within the context of the group. Yes. I think, um, with, with Simon, I don't, sorry, I, I was looking up the quote and I, I missed a part of it. Uh, but basically, with his visions <clears throat> or with his epilepsy, it, it question it can it can be questioned whether or not he has epilepsy, epilepsy, or whether or not he is you know the the spiritual member of the group, um, mm -hmm. or whether or not he's both. Because historically, you know, the modern revisions to people having visions. Um, is that they they were having fits? So the, obviously the, the most famous would be uh, would be Paul um, having his his conversion after a, a fit. Um, but with, with Simon, I think that the interesting um, way, way way he's used is the fact that it's after his encounter with with the pig head um, that he then sees the beast in its true form. So it's, I think it's, an, it's uh, either used as a contradiction or, or used to bolster the fact that he is seeing the reality in the fact that he has this conversation with, with the devil uh, or with Beelzebub. And immediately after one, he, he sees the beast in its true form and just sees that it is uh, just a, a man in a parachute. Um, what, what, what do you think of, of, of that kind of yeah, what, connection? What? What's the name for in the tribal context the sort of the the shaman? Yeah, he's kind of yeah, a, shaman, yeah, witch shaman. doctor. Yeah, he's the one who channels the spirit world, and in that context, yeah, I suppose he's the truth teller. 
Mm-hmm. He's, he's in the priestly class, you know, as as Piggy is the intellectual class, as mm-hmm. Jack is the warrior class. Mm-hmm. It's particularly horrible that he stumbles. <laughs> you know, he's the one who stumbles in to tell the truth, and that's when he's horribly beaten to death. Yes, but he's not. He's not an active. I don't feel like he's he's active actively pursuing his you know his um you know kind of etherealness yeah, uh, yeah no, I, I see what you mean um but he does no, go it, it, he, happy, it's, it, these things are happening to him yeah and, and he's he, you know he's witnessing them and he, and but he's not he's not pursuing it he's not like you know i'm he's, he's not the uh, hippie on the island doing uh you know, drugs or something. He's not to, setting himself you know, reach up. A, he's not trying to reach a higher plane or anything. You know. He, yeah, he doesn't seem to express much agency, just like a lot of the characters in the book. Well, yeah, the things person, are just happening to them. The person that demonstrates the most agency is, is Jack, because he's got that kind of heroic will about him, um, even if you don't agree with the actions that he, said, that he takes. He's... he's He's the uber man. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, exactly. He's one of the few people. Uh, Sam is one of the few people who actually helps uh, Ralph with uh, with building the huts. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and literally, it said they are Simon is helping and Piggy is useless uh, because uh, Ralph was annoyed that everybody helped with the first hut. Some people helped with the second hut, and it's only the two of them trying to build the third one. Uh, yeah. And, and, and then that goes that goes back to uh, the point about uh, time horizons and the fact that Simon seems to be the one focused primarily on the future, and uh, he, he never his focus never wavers in that respect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. That's, um... Right, so if if anyone has anything else to touch on him, um, just we'll the fact that he is a kind of sacred victim as well as Piggy in this story, I think. Yes, so I've got that as is one of the themes of the book is um, the balance of religiosity versus scientism, not just mm-hmm. science, but specifically scientism, because the two extremes of that are in Piggy and in Simon. And both of them die in a way that it, it's almost an, an ironic death for both of them, where <clears throat> Simon, being the most spiritual, is, is killed in a ritual. Um, he's almost, you know, a, a ritualistic sacrifice. Um, and with with Piggy, um, obviously, he's meant to be the brainy one of the, of the lot. And when he falls off the cliff and and, and dies and hits his head, it, it, it says mm-hmm. that his, it basically is his brain. <laughs> Uh, empties out. So <laughs> both of them have uh, an equivalent death in terms of what their main theme is for that. I mean, he, he Golding is, you know, presents an example of what uh, Rene Girard talks about in a lot of um, detail, the victim mechanism in religion. You know, how um, religion, you know, his argument is like that Traditionally, the gods, you know, emerge out of a kind of mob violence. Uh, there's a sacred victim who then sort of makes everybody, f- after the sacred victim is killed, everybody feels um, soothed by this. And then the sort of god emerges out of that. And that then Christianity becomes like the ultimate um, revelation of that mechanism. Well, it's, it's at work in the story, but Piggy is like, the obvious victim that we we all sort of sense that there's something coming, but is yeah. more surprised with Simon. Well, when yeah. Simon dies, like it's always very unspoken, isn't it? Nobody wants to talk about it. It's, um, everybody feels yeah. like ashamed that it happened. They'll know what happened, and they try and they'll try and justify, you know, what's happened. But it, yeah, and, how people and res- you, you carry one on. of one of the interesting parts is literally everyone participates in killing Simon. That's that's focused on and mentioned by Golding specifically, in that everyone participated, including Piggy. Yeah, they all get drawn in. To the, uh... Yes, yeah, it's like the death of their innocence is is uh, felt by everyone. But I think that one of the most interesting parts of Simon's death is how every major character either tries to rationalize it, or the only person that does actually 
realize what they've done is Ralph. Um, and not only does he realize that he that he participated in murdering Simon, he also he he's the most emotionally self-aware and perceptive because he he even realizes that basically piggy tries to justify it by saying that we were we were all scared and we didn't know what was happening but but yeah. ralph actually says no we we did know what was happening we kind of enjoyed it um, he turns to piggy doesn't he and piggy tries to kind of help ralph out yeah. by giving him piggy tries to post hoc rationalize jack uses it as as uh, a way to bolster his claim um by saying that it was basically a, a an apparition of 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 the devil and that they fought against it and that they're going to have to keep on fighting against it so it, ca- it kind of he, he he uses it in a way to manipulate everyone else to stick around him um, as is in his nature and ralph is the only one that that, that, that admits to it really <laughs> Yeah, so. and, and Piggy tries to, yeah, he says, like, at first he says, no, I was in there, and and, and it was horrible, you know, and Piggy's like, no, I don't think you were. You were on the outside. Like, <laughs> we were both on the outside. <laughs> Which fits always completely be fun, with, fun with and that, fits, that fits completely with Piggy's perspective of, you know, uh, I have no agency, and I'm, you know, already a beaten man, so mm-hmm. it's not my fault, it's not my responsibility, and and he offers to to Ralph the same excuse he's been using his entire life. It's no, no, it wasn't really your fault. You didn't really have anything to do with it. You know, here's 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 a way to get away with it, in, at least in your own mind. Yeah, he doesn't take ownership of any of his actions. <laughs> and oddly, uh, uh, Jack never mentions it. It's just like uh, they you only hear Ralph and Piggy talk about it. And, and well, he does he does mention it, but he but he doesn't use it he doesn't describe it as the death of simon he describes it as, as, as the death of of the beast yeah um so let's bring up and the, sam and eric are both there and they also contribute you know to it well, and or let's, you, let's touch on sam and eric yeah. now then yeah go ahead with, with what you were thinking well i was just going to mention that they were both there and they're they're more than willing to accept piggy's excuse um to absolve their own consciousness Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so Sam and Eric. I've put down just a list of the uh, of the minor characters here. <clears throat> Sam and Eric. There's not much to say on from me, to be honest. Um, the only the only real thing that I've noticed in reading it is that the further along you go in the book, the more they're discussed as separate people, and it kind of shows uh, the separation of, of the group as a whole by them being discussed first as Sam and Eric, and then the further we go, the more they're broken up into Sam is speaking and then Eric is speaking. Yeah, well, they're, they're also... they start out like like they're twins, but they, they're so indistinct that they are considered one person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, they'll finish each of the sentences and things, won't they? And, and <laughs> right up till the end, until they're tortured, and then then it's the first time you, it's like you see Sam or Eric, and then you actually don't know which one it is. But then they're separated. Up to that point, you do everything together. Yeah, and, and they serve the author as a proxy of the everyman. You know, they 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 demonstrate how the the general populace, uh, at least the populace that matters gets pulled in the various directions throughout the story until the end where they get incorporated into quote unquote, the, the, the bad side, basically uh, without truly consenting to it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they, they kind of want to be you know, torture and punishment. With, yeah. They work with Ralph, don't they, for most of it. And... Yeah, right. I cajole into it. And then they're subsumed into this kind of unit when they lose their you know, individuality even more than before <laughs> and behind these masks and you know, they just become the savages. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about Roger? What do people have to say about Roger? He's the most kindest and loving person in the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really to <laughs> No, he's, a, he's, he's the natural born sadist, the, the one, um, although he, he proposes to have a, um, a vote on who's leader in the beginning, he's, he starts out like he doesn't belong to any group, he's not part of the choir, but he, he turns out that he is, he is educated 
in the beginning, it's, it's told he's throwing rocks at one of the little ones. And he can't seem to be able to hit the little one because his arm was conditioned not to do it, which mm. is still like, okay, he, he has been taught not to do that. But you see over time more and more, he becomes more and more of a sadist. And at the end, he's basically the the torturer of the group who makes sure that uh, everybody stays in line. So he's, he's probably the, the most natural savage that is in there. The, the, the one that, that maybe is more classic. It fits the classic sociopathic archetype yeah. in that he supports whatever power structure it is he thinks is going to allow him to uh, embrace his nature. And yeah. as as that power structure gets weakened, as, as the bounds of boundaries of civilization get weakened, he uh, degenerates into a, a violent and vicious, vicious person. I, I think I think he sees other people as more as objects than as persons. So then he fits the least in the society. So if the society turns into something where it becomes more savage, then he will be more in his element. Yeah, but his conditioning of the you know the society he's left behind is is the thing that kind of holds him in place for the longest, you know, until yeah. he dissipates. But yeah, I've always found it interesting that he was the one to put forward the idea of of, of having a vote. Because it yeah, kind like of... he, it's like he needs he needs the um you know he needs the uh, things in place you know the, 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 from his, the, well it's, all, it's yeah it's either that he needs a structure there he he's self aware that he that if there's not a structure to to keep him down then he's going to let his most uh, primal instincts come through um, or it's or it's uh, showing Perfect. that he's Sorry, it, it, I was just going to say it's perfect camouflage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah maybe a, I, I think I'm just looking at everyone very cynically. <laughs> but yeah, he, I, he, I completely agree. He is a bit like Piggy. So Piggy does is also somebody who's yes. low low status, and he is also low status because he doesn't he's he's not that crafty with people, uh, and and but he finds his niche, and that niche is a terrible niche, but he finds it and then he flourishes. Uh, yeah, so I guess yeah, it's I like Piggy, they both need society, but they both need it for different reasons. Yes, that's a really good, yeah, that's a succinct way of putting it. That's, and it's a way that I've not even looked at it until that, that discussion. And I think he's the only one on the island that actually hides his true character. Everyone else is, is pretty, for, even though they change over time, like even with Jack, from the get-go, he doesn't really hide his true self. It's just that he changes over time. I, I don't think he is that he is who he is at the end of the book, at the start of the book. But with with Roger, if he was left alone in a room, he with with, with the situation where he could act out what he's doing without consequences. Uh, yes, then then from the get go, he would have done that. Yeah. Yeah. Which bit is which? which who is it in the bit with the sandcastles? Roger is that, the one that kicked over the sandcastles. That's Roger. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, Maurice was it? Yeah, Maurice is the one who who stops and because he sees the little ones cry, and, and Roger doesn't care, which yeah, fits yeah. with the with the psychopath uh, where he he it's uh, I mean he has feelings, he just doesn't believe that other people have feelings. That's that's kind of what, is, what happens with the psychopath, as far as I understand it, and it seems yeah. to fit with this with him. People are like furniture. Yeah. Yeah, the sort of uh, narrator, kind of limited omniscient narrator, gives us the inner life of of ralph and the inner life of piggy to some degree as well but we don't get a lot of other insight into the inner life of people as far as i can remember those are the main characters right yeah i don't, I don't think you, you need it with roger because it's mm -hmm. quite clear in the end from his actions what kind of person he is mm -hmm. yeah although that being said, you you know that it would if it was made now, it would have that backstory where it was uh, you know he was he was he was beaten as a child, and that's why he's oh, yeah, yeah, it would have to, such a graphic it would have to justify, justify, Yeah, uh, it couldn't show it, it would have to justify yeah. why he was a psycho. Or not it it wouldn't show him with a you know a loving mother and father. You know, would it? It, it would show him. You know, it would show some negative thing that had made him that way. I yes, think I yeah, think Colin feel... wisely uh, avoided the whole nature nurture debate about uh, mm -hmm. about that one. Yeah, now, well, this is the thing. This book has been taken as a, as uh, a lot of people look at it as him making a comment on that and saying that it is 
naturalistic for, for humans to be evil. And the, the criticism I saw, I saw of it is that if humans are innately evil, then why doesn't uh, Ralph join with Jack? And, and it's, it's a really, it's a really stupid criticism, I think, because it's not that man is inherently evil. It's that man is inherently capable of evil. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. all respond that everyone on that Island could have committed some atrocities to one another. They it's did. Some of them did. Yeah. No, they all did. Remember, they killed Simon. Well, I, well no, yeah, no, that, I suppose that, yeah, that's true. That's, that's true. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, but I don't think, but it's not a comment on the fact. It, it's not saying that everyone is just innately evil. It's that everyone yeah. has the capacity to. Right. Yeah. There's a darkness you get, you get, in all people. Yeah. You get the people who blame society, you know, or, you know, I, I blame society or whatever, but it, it, it kind of takes it the opposite way. It's like society is the only thing that's keeping them together. Mm -hmm. You know, and the more that society drifts away, the, the worse some of them get. You know, well, it's it's the Hobbesian ideal of you know every man against you know a battle of all against all. Yes, versus but you, Rousseau. But you could also also see that if you say, well, they blame society for that it happened, they also see to some degree that they are the society. Yes, so, exactly. So and and because it's such a small group, it, it becomes really hard to say no. It's not me. It's all the other kids, uh, because they were there. And they uh, they know they have some they have some influence if they wanted to, but they didn't stop it. It also demonstrates that society is what the members of society choose it to be. And if the members of society choose to live in savagery, then society becomes savage. Yeah, that yeah. reminds me of that old the old Thatcher quote that everyone got so angry about, where there is no society, but in it's in the sense of that there isn't. A, there isn't a person called society that sat around planning to uh, destroy people's lives. Society is the, even though it does in some ways take on a personality of its own, it's still created by everyone that's involved in it. Yeah, the so, She went on to say, you know, there are men, there are women, yes. there are families. Yeah. Yeah, well, who'd have thought she was misquoted and, and it was cut yeah, out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, nowadays, uh, if there were a remake, um, Piggy would have to be the villain because he used the N word. So <laughs> we weren't going to touch on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, Next no, uh, it was just once. Okay. <laughs> yes, but again, you know, we we cut that <laughs> we cut that quote out because. It has exactly the same. The, the meaning of it is is basically just uh, savagery. Um, oh, I know. Yeah, acting I know. like a savage, savage. Anyway, moving mm -hmm. swiftly on from that, who, who else have we got? Little ones. Um, and any, anyone else on the minor characters that we want to touch on? The marked boy, I think, is an interesting one for again with the religious symbology. Um, when they're when they're on the island, the first boy to die has a mulberry stain on his face. Assume, assume death. Assume death. What's that it's a birthmark, isn't it? It's assumed it's a birthmark. Yeah, no, no, yeah, they, yeah. they they assume that he died. They just can't find him anymore. Well, so. yeah, no, that's true. He, we we never we never find his body, so don't know one way or the other. The first child to go missing, um, yeah, has a has a birthmark on his face. Um, obviously, if you're looking at it for a religious allegory, he, he's he's being marked for death, and he he speaks to a serpent shortly before his death. Um, there's little hints here and there of, of that kind of... Um, he, he, introduces the pro he introduces the concept of the beast. So, so yes. he, he, he starts yeah. out during the first meeting saying, well, there's a beast. Um, and, and Ralph's response is really interesting because he, he kind of denies it. Like there is no he beast. Angry, and, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. And that, that that already shows if you if you look at this whole thing from um, uh, if you, you guys know the Maslow pyramid right like you have this yeah, base yeah. needs mm -hmm. like food shelter and on top there's this um, there's this this goal and just to com get complete satisfaction you see that that this this need for safety is really on the on the lower rungs of the pyramid and Jack actually provides those lower levels and and Ralph doesn't and so there's a need to have that satisfied and that's also why people flock to Jack because he does provide safety and food and uh, so so this this marked boy introduces that and at first he describes it as a snake 
What's also interesting is that the beast changes shape depending on, on what they what they encounter. Yeah. Uh, because at some point, saying while well, he was chasing me, and he was, uh, it becomes more human-like. So that's uh, that's that's also odd that it, this beast also it fits the niche of what they encounter, so they can fill in the blanks themselves. Yes. Yeah. Which is what I mean, as I said at the beginning, where. You know, you take the kind of rationalist approach that, that Piggy might have, which would be that everything that they're encountering, they're then transferring the idea of the beast onto it. So yeah. it, might, it might just be a vine that they come across, but they assume it's a snake. Um, and then, you know, the beast, when it's when it's the marooned parachuter who's died, um, they then see the body of a, the figure of a man. Um, but it, but it doesn't matter when it gets to that stage. It's so ingrained in them, and it's being used by both sides to kind of com combat against each other um, their ideas of the beast. That, that at that stage, it doesn't even matter if it's real or not. And then there was the, and then there was the quote that you know the beast. Maybe there is a beast, and maybe it's us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Which kind of ticks both of those boxes. It's. It, it's uh, taking both sides of it. Let's 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 go on to the. Uh, actually, I think the sailor we might want to touch on before we move on. But, um... Yeah, he's the the guy that appears in the end. Um, so this this whole book, there is this whole conflict about getting the signal fire going and keeping it going. And in the end, when uh, Ralph is being chased by uh, the rest of the tribe, uh, the tribe sets the force on, uh, the the force on fire, which creates a, a huge amount of smoke, which actually draws in the the uh, the navy. So this 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 navy officer, he is on the beach, uh, and and Ralph encounters him in the end, and the other boys, and this this jarringly takes them out of the conflict, and they return to being boys. Uh, and and this this sailor actually can't believe what happens. He refers to the Coral Island, that book where this this uh, about the three boys who do uh, all this having this fun adventure on the island. And he says, it's something like that. And they say, yeah. And then they say, and then, then he asked, did, did anybody got hurt? And then they have to admit that a couple of them died. So it's quite- But even then they don't even get the figure right, if I'm correct. <laughs> well, he yeah, says, he, I, I think, I think Simon, or, uh, Ralph says he doesn't know. Yeah, they don't yeah. know. They don't know how many died. And it, yeah. it is very jarring, isn't it? Because at the point where you meet him, it, it, the the bit with the chase and you know it, it kind of I don't know it felt I felt, I felt like listening to it because I did the audio book it kind of really pulled you in mm -hmm. like to the actual chase and mm -hmm. what was happening and then all of a sudden it's like boom you know like they're yeah. on the beach and it's like you know, all of a sudden you've been pulled into Ralph's story at that point it's all Ralph's yeah. point of view isn't it and then all of you a forget sudden just how far they've they've fallen. You, yeah. Until you get and an outside yeah. perspective to say, hang on a minute, what, what's what's happening? Yeah, <laughs> and it's like then they're also reminded of the thing that they were supposed to be trying to do, like the you know when he says, um, you know, uh, I can't remember the wording he uses now. You Being know, like, British. You, yeah, you you, you 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 don't look like little British boys, you know. Mm. And then all of a sudden you get the idea that Jack feels quite embarrassed that he's all painted up and acting like a savage. Uh, this sailor yeah. asks who's the who's who's your leader, and then Ralph says I am, and then Jack wants to interrupt him, saying no, I'm the leader, but then he stops because then he knows yeah. he has to take responsibility for what what has happened. Hmm. And it's also what you say about uh, Quackhouse, what you say about him being painted up. It's up until this point, masks and being painted up have all been used very effectively as a way of. Um, depersoning yourself and allowing you to commit acts that you never would do otherwise. But nothing like nothing like current society. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you suggesting uh, yeah, something so, about uh, group mantle? I'm <laughs> suggesting something about masks. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, um, but uh, <laughs> but um, after that, as soon as the sailor sees them all. The utility of that completely goes because obviously they've come from from that society. It, it's only it, it's a synthetic society that he's made. It's not actually the one that he's come from. Uh, if these were a, a tribe that had been established for a long time, and and obviously the people came along, th these symbols would still have utility because they would still be ingrained in 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 the group. But once they're reintroduced to this 
society that they're from and that they're used to, um, all of that pretense just drops out and they go back to, they kind of revert to what they were when they first landed. I like the detail of young Percival, blah, 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 with his address, but he, he then forgets his name, basically, you yeah, know, yeah. right at the end. So he's been sort of, it's almost like his identity has been wiped out, like temporarily, I'm sure, but. Yes. Yeah. So the others have all been, uh, the, the, the uh, Jack and his crew have all been pulled into Project Mayhem. <laughs> Well, I, I want to. The, before I move on, I do want to cover actually just in general the little ones, uh, because in some ways they have the worst journey of all. <laughs> because some of the we we have no number of how many small children are running around, and by the end, they are basically so involved um, um, that they're just like pot-bellied, savage-looking like feral children. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're the proper NPCs, aren't they? <laughs> of the game that is Jack and Ralph. Yes, they're, they're just the complete bystanders of the of the game, of the great game above them. Um, and so I, I think that it's interesting that you put those on, you put them alongside it so that there are, it's not just that everyone is this major figure in this conflict. There are just these uh, mindless wandering children that completely lost without leadership basically it's also that normally in, in normal society they would be the future they, they would have you know they, they would be the thing that because normally children you know people put them up there mm. don't they uh, mm -hmm. but because there is no future because there's no women and yeah it, it's like we don't need to worry about the future we don't need to worry about the um the kind of the hope that they represent being the mm -hmm next generation because there is no you know if we know that it's going to end with if not us them and we're not we don't care well, i don't think that that's really the direction in which it, it, it it's not that the, the the lack of women or the lack of you know a possible multi-generational society is the case it's that the leadership doesn't pay attention to the future. They don't care about it. The, you know, those that have an effect yeah. on, on this plot don't care, not, you know. But it's also it's, that there is no future, really. Uh, once, he's, well, there once, could he abandons, be. once he abandons the smoke stack, the, one, the smoke, then, then that's it. Well, but that's the yeah, point. They are, I mean, the point they are is resigning they're... themselves to the next 40 years or whatever it's going to be. Because... Right, but, the, but the, that's the point. The point is there could be a future. There could be, uh, uh, you know, rescue. There could be all of these positive things mm. if they'd look past the nose on the end of their face and, and make plans and, and stick to the plans. That's, that's yeah, not something I, Jack, isn't it? That's not something a kid would do. I, I think the little ones are, are kind of disregarded because they they don't have no value at that point. They can't hunt and yep. they can't build anything. They're just eating and and. and defecating everywhere uh, in, in the wrong places as well <laughs> yeah so so they, 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 they the drinking actually, water <laughs> and, until they're actually able to do something they're a burden on society aren't they so, just kind of yeah. the proles i mean they're not yes. not maybe not the working class but the underclass or something yeah and and yeah. so so the, the the society that that uh ultimately jack ends up with is is one that's based on on merit so Jack is the best hunter, and then you have, have people who can do stuff. And basically, they take from Piggy the only thing that he has is merit, which is his glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that there were also a recognition that um, in a society, self-sacrifice is required to put into the society, much like with the signal fire. Um, the children uh, uh, also need self Because they don't have any, any use at the moment, you do require... To, uh, what you put into them at the moment doesn't actually yield any reward until much later on. It's it's a yeah, society that is of uh, investment averse. They they they're not yes. interested in investing anything in the future. Yes. Consequently, they don't recognize any potential future value. Mm -hmm. And there's the idea that boys specifically uh, don't have this, any value until they are something. Mm -hmm. So. You know the little ones aren't something yet. You know they're not hunters, they're not adventurers, they're not hut builders, whatever. They they, are, they don't have any value. Where as if they'd have been girls, you could always 
apply value to them. You know, yeah, the inherent the, value the of babies. women versus the actualized value of men. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you're not really worth anything until you've proved yourself. You've got a job, you know, like yeah, the idea, what do you do kind of thing? You don't do anything. Oh, well, see you later. Right. Let's go on to the symbols. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I may have uh, committed some perjury by stealing this image from you, uh, freelance. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Well done. Uh, like <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think we've we've touched on all of them already, but let, what what do, what do people want to dig into when it comes to any of the symbols that we've had? Um, should we start with the conch and kind of work our way down on, on these? That we've touched on what the conch represents, um, but who who has anything that they want to say about it? I, th I think it it's, uh, it represents either democracy or cooperation by uh, consensus. So instead of that, you have like an authoritarian that that's like Jack who dictates stuff. Uh, they have meetings in which they discuss stuff and they use the conscious the symbol of, of power for this. And Pig, Piggy sees this really as the most important thing on the island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, it's most beneficial likes, to him. He likes to press it, doesn't he? He likes to yeah. press it. He's it's, got the conch. I've got the conch. It's, yeah. It's kind of uh, both voice and control of voice rolled into one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it, it's interesting that you mentioned Piggy alongside it because obviously it's it is a symbol and it does have power within it, but it it only has a limited amount of power. And when Piggy tries to make use of it, it, it still doesn't work because people just <laughs> his 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 hatred from the group overrules the the power of the conch basically. Um, mm. And the other really interesting quote from Ralph again, which goes back to him being the most perceptive of the kids as opposed to the best leader, is his recognition that using the conch at an inappropriate time will completely erode its value. So they have a discussion, yeah. everyone runs off to do their own thing, um, and they've kind of disobeyed what, what Ralph wants done. Uh, Piggy suggests to him, blow the conch to get them all back. And, and Ralph's response is that by blowing it now, if they don't come back, the conch is done for. It's completely meaningless now. Yeah, yeah it, it, it doesn't want them to be overused. Well, of the symbols on the list, it's the only one that doesn't have any inherent value. Mm -hmm. it, it, the only it's value given, it's it has... Given a monetary value at, it's given a monetary value at the start, isn't it? Right, but, but even... But, but, you know, going back to... Mengir's imputed uh, value hierarchy. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it, 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 the fact that it, it makes a noise, like it could, there is a certain amount of value in that, like it could call people to. But but even then, calling people is if people don't come, it has no value. That that's you know this is all social value. It it has it is it is value yeah, so recognized and appreciated by the society, not inherent in the object. As long as, as people have the consensus that this uh, this rule is applied, then it, then it has value because then they will respect it. But as soon as as you see this with Jack, that he says the conch doesn't apply to this side of the island or the conch doesn't uh, apply to the to when we're on the mountain, then Ralph has to reinforce the rule that it does, and that that ha works a couple of times. But at some moment, there's people start disregarding it. So. The value is not in the item itself, but into the fact that people are willing to play by the rules. Yeah, it's like a ballot, isn't it? It doesn't have inherent uh, value on its own. It's only when you fill it in and uh, submit it <laughs> yeah. if everyone only agrees. Only if you recognize it, if you say, you know, yes, I don't recognize it. It's only your, if you, everyone recognizes <laughs> the value of a, of a ballot that, uh, that it has that it has any value. Otherwise, it's just yeah. a meaningless piece of paper. Purely yeah. social value. <laughs> Now, one thing that's not on the list that probably should be is, is Jack's knife. Yes, that's a good point, actually. Um, and also, Ralph has a knife, but it, it's literally mentioned once, I think. Yeah, it's sort of he's mentioned using it, but he doesn't. Yeah. They never state that he has it, like like they make a big point about with uh, Jack. Yeah. It's well, I guess that, that that identifies both of them as potential leaders. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And not just leaders, but the leadership through. Like that, that warrior action. So. <clears throat> I was just saying one more thing with the conch, like uh, the the colouring of it that's described as uh, fading over time, like as you know, as the uh, society fades away, you know, as the society they've left mm -hmm. fades away from the group, 
like the, the conch is fading in color as well so it's almost like transparent by the end yes and it's fading it as... and when it gets to its ultimate uh when it's lost all color it's Smart. then compared with the whiteness of the skull of the pig head and so the comparison is basically made that the, the either the the value of the conch and the pig head is now equal mm. as they are both now devoid of any color or it could be a transference of power from the conch to the pig head Wh whatever the connection is there it's definitely deliberate that he's he's saying the conch has now lost all meaning and the, and the pig head is it the, is uh is taking over it, <laughs> it fades physically and in its abilities and... yes yeah uh, do you want to go on on the, the knife sorry brandig well, I was just mentioning that because it hadn't been uh, listed amongst these, but uh, Jack's knife is is basically the source uh, and the demonstration of his of his core being. I mean, I guess it, he he is the warrior. He is the one who is going to you know struggle with nature and win. And the fact that it's a knife and not a bow. Or, or any kind of a ranged weapon implies that the struggle is is immediate and visceral, and an intimate. Uh, an intimate yes, and, and more. I, I don't know the, the the direction I take from it is more that it is it is immediate. Um, mm -hmm. Therefore, it has no you know long term perspective. It's 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 all short term, immediate, uh, instant uh, action, uh, just like the meat. Because they don't have any mechanism for storing the meat. So once you kill the pig, you can only eat it then. But there's no long-term mechanism for storing it. Whereas I the think, fruit could conceivably, you know, be stored for a while. I think I think it could also be that with a knife, if, if you had a bow, it, the utility of a bow is purely in firing the bow at, at, at the, the pigs. With a knife, it is a tool, but it's that it's used as a weapon which sums up the personality so, of also it's also the thing that makes Jack. sticks the, the, the pointed sticks are also you can also produce them with a knife so. yeah but again he's using it to to make weaponry whereas i think maybe the mm -hmm. fact that ralph has a knife but he doesn't really use it is that he he uses it i'm trying to remember it's only it's only used to mark jack's knife is that correct i think so so it's only used as a tool. With 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 Ralph, his 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 knife is never used as a weapon. It's only used as a tool. Uh, whereas Jack is the complete reverse. I just want to say that one can also use a bow to make fire. Yeah. I've never seen that, but okay. Yeah, you, How do you, you do put that? the um, you, you put you put a loop with the uh, with a with a stick. Oh, so right. So when you yeah. push it backwards and forwards, it, it spins it round. Oh, and so you, it's just, you, it's you just spin a, it. an easy yeah, way yeah, of doing yeah. that. Okay, yeah. wearing your hands out, yeah. I guess. Yeah, no, I have seen I've seen that. I didn't even think about doing it with a bow. See, that's how useless I, I would have been. I am the I, piggy I, of the group. <laughs> you'd have just blistered your hands, you see. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, is, is the knife so a Swiss on. Army knife type thing or? Like something you'd carry. No, it's like a Bowie knife. Oh, At least that's the description I've seen. Like I, a book I, knife. I like a, yeah. I imagine if it's something a child would have. Yeah, like a pen knife, I think. Back, back oh, in the I, day. Back in the I was day, under the impression it was a straight straight knife, like a like a buck knife or or like a you know a six or eight inch blade. Why would a kid it's carry gonna... something like that? Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know if it's ever actually explicitly no, mentioned how big it is. I don't think it describes it, does it? What, what would be the use of a knife in a choir? Yeah, that's why I kind of had it in my head as being a pen knife because it does have utility. Threaten. Other, it, whereas if you just have, you know, like a like a Bowie knife, that is, that's a big blade. But pen knives were not that uncommon. It's 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 mostly yeah, they didn't come, they didn't that, come, uh, they didn't come from London in the uh, in the year uh, twenty twenty, did they? <laughs> <laughs> I think we know why the choir didn't like him <laughs> and threatened them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... it's never implied that anybody gets st uh, anybody may might get stabbed, is it? I don't think. Not with no, Ralph, except, anyway. except with the spears. So, yeah, yeah, nobody's threatened with the knives, though. They they want to put yeah. Ralph's hat on a stick in the end. Mm. Yeah, sharpened at both ends. ends. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Okay, right. I didn't get that right. Okay. 
Oh yeah. So when he's referring to it being sharpened at both ends, it's that one one end is going to go into the ground and the other end is ah, going to yes. go into okay. Ralph's right. neck. Um, As so a sacrifice for the beast. Yeah. yeah. So what about the fire? Uh, we've touched on that again. Um, Aren't we skipping the big head? On it? Oh, sorry, I did skip it. Didn't I? Oh, the yeah, let's let's touch on the big head then. Covered I briefly think, on when we went, spoke about uh, Beelzebub. It's, I think it's uh, it's it's uh, used as both a religious sacrifice for the beast, mm -hmm. as a um, allegory of the Lord of the Flies itself. So it's 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 uh, because Simon encounters it when it's all rotten, uh, and so it it it, it kind of symbolizes that they've they've let go of society and now are trying to appease parts of nature mm -hmm. um, and, and 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 this in contrast with the conch which is mm -hmm. uh, which symbolizes like society and civility well the yeah. big head is savagery yeah it's, it's also i mean this going back a little bit to simon but when golding writes the confrontation between simon and, and the pig head the only time that he goes quite some of it can get a little bit surreal in in his writing and he does he does do a little bit more surreal writing in other books like there's one called pincher martin where it's all a little bit uh <laughs> out there it's about it's it's about a dying sailor out at sea um and it's all metaphor and like dream states and everything um and i think that it's it works very well that this encounter is the only time he he, he goes anywhere close to being outside the bounds of reality Mm -hmm. yeah, it was a really good book. I, I felt like it was a really good part of the book as well. Like I enjoyed it, like the uh, you know, yeah. the abstractness of it and the uh, yeah, it makes the, it more the kind of impactful. The, the, the fact feel that of it, it's, yeah, it's only that 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 uh, has that kind of writing style. Yeah, yeah. and it's really brought yeah, it's, yeah, like you say, impactful. Discussing really so powerful. It stands alone. Um, so, yeah, the, the, any, anything else on, on any of these? The fire. Uh, the, the fire, the fire was, really the fire is, is kind of symbolic of society, mm -hmm. uh, civilization, of civilization. Yeah. So, so in the beginning, and and, and also also of, of chaos, because it, at some point mm -hmm. the fire goes actually twice the fire goes out of control, and yes. the uh, yeah. uh, the fire on the mountain, which is then smoke, which has to signal the ship. They talk about cooking fires. They they talk about that when Jack has taken over the the, the signal fire has has become a, just a measly cooking fire. They're not going to uh, to signal anybody with it. So it, it it has some symbology as in something they uh, the state of, of of what they're in with their with their group. Well, it could be an allegory for humanity as a force. You know, humanity focused on the present, cooking the meat. Humanity focused on the future, signaling. The boat, humanity out of control, the raging fires, humanity, you know, chasing and, and pursuing the uh, uh, the individual or the outcast toward the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like it's like energy. It's it, it's um, it's the potential. Yeah, I don't know if this is what you said, but like human potential, basically, mm -hmm. depending on the direction. The idea that it needs people to maintain it and yeah. also to keep it contained or, or techne, like. You know the thing that it can be can be can build your society or can destroy your society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a good way of looking at it. I I I, I see it a lot as uh, self sacrifice as well because it's something that requires everyone to put into it and without knowing. It, to go back to your time preference uh, point, <laughs> Randig, it, it is very much a representation of that. That if you want to see any kind of uh, long term success or uh, out out of a civilization that you need to put into, you need to put part of yourself in the fire, um, even if you don't get a return on it. Because if everyone doesn't contribute to it, it's going to go out. Uh, okay, so Piggy's glasses. <laughs> the, real, <laughs> the real the real, uh, the real uh, symbol of power. So yeah, one of the things is that well, Piggy he he values the conch. A lot actually he holds the real power which is the ability to make fire and that's also the reason why in the end they they steal his glasses and and, and not him uh and and leave the conch where it is they uh, jack jack needs to be the ability to make fire and he takes it from piggy 
Prometheus. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's very good. Yeah. Good analogy. Uh, I, I'd also suggest it's more, I mean, it, it's also an allegory towards society as well, you know, because it is it an comes object. from society, doesn't it? Yes, it's an artifact of society and, and collective action toward a, a, a non immediate goal. You know, in fact, the people who made the glasses can't possibly be the ones for whom they were intended because one needs to be able to see to make the glasses in the first place. Yeah, and I think it's also, it's just uh, technology as a whole. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm thinking of what it must have been like to be in Britain post-Roman occupation, but, uh, you know, so far along that, that you don't even have any kind of recollection of, of, of Roman occupation and coming across like an aqueduct or something like that where, you know, it's just technology that is so far removed from you that, that you have no concept of what else to do apart from use it for its like most base and most primal action. Like Piggy's glasses, they are, you know, it took hundreds of years to design uh, glasses to, to, to allow this child to see. But when they're on the island, what what is it? It can make fire. We can we can make fire with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All of the kind of civilized civilizational technology that goes alongside it is lost in comparison to just it it makes fire. And there's the fact that in in the start, you know, I mean, there's nothing even in the beginning for them to stop them from just saying, "Let's just give you glasses, piggy," and then <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, that's only lost towards the end. You know, like again, it's the nature, nature, the the the, the nature of society. You know, that there is something stopping them from literally just taking it. It emphasizes how vulnerable somebody like Piggy would be in in a primitive society. You know, really. Mm. Yes. Um... Is there any other symbols that we have? I mean, the island itself might be considered one because the island, when they get to a vantage point, if I remember correctly, it's shaped like a boat. Um, so I do wonder if that's some kind of reference to the, the I don't know, the journey that the characters take, or it, it's it's it's, it's there a for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Any any other symbols? We're going to touch on the themes next, so uh, we can we can drag some of the other symbols that might come out of that. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to. I, I noticed you listed the tempest as one of the uh, you know oh, foundation yes. sort of uh, intertexts. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the descriptions in particular of um, Simon's body as it's subsumed into the sea is. Mm -hmm really reminds me of passages from the tempest i mean among other things there's a there's a song that describes a body at the bottom of the sea that's been sort of covered in uh pearls and shells and things like that and sort of mm -hmm. become part of the sea and we see a similar process happening in this one paragraph that's very, it's very yeah that's a good point um uh, yeah no I, I i put it down there as 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 an influence and and the other one I think I put down was Robinson Crusoe, which obviously has a very different <laughs> idea of, of what would happen being stranded. But I think at the Tempest is probably the closest book yeah. in terms of situation <laughs> that came before this. The kind of scenes where, you know, they're hearing things and there's a lot of hallucinatory parts like mirages and things like that. And that's very similar in the Tempest as well. You have the sailors hearing things because there's magic in the island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, sorry. Just. Um, right. Okay. Let's go on to the themes. Um, we've covered quite a lot of them already, but are there any that stand out that you want to dig into more than we have done already? I think masks we've touched on briefly, but would be a good one to explore a bit more. <laughs> and not relating to uh, 2020. <laughs> it's the uh, dehumanization of. Uh... Of, of the character so at the one point uh, when, when when they start raiding for fire and for piggy's glasses the, it, they did and at the end when uh, ralph is being chased all the savages become all the kids become non the script they just become one of the the tribes members so they lose their personality and this mm -hmm. also happened with uh, roger in the beginning 
uh, when he puts on uh, when he when he puts on like clay to to as a mask, and then he washes it off, revealing again that he's just a child. Yeah, and that's the crucial part. I think we, we've mentioned this uh, on our last discussion. It's one of the most interesting parts about the mask um, theme is that masking is something having having some kind of mask to in some way dehumanize you or to embody something else above above you in a more spiritual sense has has, has been used you know in f forever <laughs> most likely um but it's the the crucial part is the fact that you have to unmask whereas the children once they are, they get to a stage where they take on these forms they they take they they mask up they they lose their humanity but they never unmask so if it was, it starts off with hunting the boar, or so, isn't it? Um, they mask up for that, and then, and then once the hunt is complete, then you can, then you can kind of come back to reality. But with the children, they get to a stage where they're always masked up, and they can never go back to reality. The mask kind of becomes the reality, yes. isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, once, once they get to that stage, they are. Yeah, it, one of the advantages of the mask is like it, it it hides the the emotions on your face and the sort of vulnerability, you know, so people can't read you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it allows you to commit things as a group, you know, and not as an individual. And Ralph, and on that note, when Ralph first put the mask on and and joined the hunting party, he you know he said he hit the 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 pig. But no one cared because he didn't bring it down. So mm. he was just yeah. part of the group and part of the group's action, and the group hadn't finished yet. So yeah, he gets uh, quite involved, doesn't he? Yeah, which goes back to what I say. He 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 understands the utility. Well, I don't know if he fully understands it, but he he emotionally identifies with it when he goes out and joins them and does go through the process of masking up and being involved in that atmosphere. He 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 feels how they. He, he at least temporarily feels how they must feel to be part of that situation, but he's it's just not he is a loner, like in the best sense of the word. He prefers to just be out on his own, uh, so he never yeah. fully identifies with that. <clears throat> he doesn't need a group, does he, to be able to, you know, yes, which life. works both in his favor and it's also, a de but it's a detriment, uh, if you're trying to be a leader. And it's also uh, demonstrated that the, the hunting requires the group because when Jack goes out to hunt on its, on his own, he's unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, what, what else have we got on there? We've covered a scientism. I mean, good and evil is kind of on the nose. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I don't know if there's anything that's really stuck out to anyone that they want to cover. Could, could you expand on the, the passing of time as a oh yeah so that one we've we've gone through uh, mainly through the use of of hair um it's a big he, he does it a lot yeah. in, in terms of yeah the growing of the hair being a part of the passing of time i also think that a lot of the descriptions of the passing of time are a, a little bit hazy but i don't think that's done accidentally it, it's yeah, it's almost they, like they, you they, never they really know how yeah, you, you never know how long they've been here, and, mm -hmm. and, and nor do we. Uh, yeah, classes. And the I just put on there because fading of the, the fading of the conch as well. It's yeah, so they've got those kind of signifiers there that do give them an indication, but obviously they, they never know. And obviously <laughs> they, they don't really need to know because Piggy suggests that they set up a sundial. Um, but again, it's hard. Mm. I, I don't remember who responds, but it's. You know, they basically say, "Where's the utility in it? Why do we? It, why, why does it matter if it's five past six or half past six to us at the moment?" Well, yeah, did he or, say, "Let's build"? Did he say, "Let's build a radio and let's build the something uh, yes, else as yeah. well"? Yeah, mocking him. And yeah. in, in terms of seasons, um, the setting kind of uh, gets you know the fact that you're in a in an exotic island uh, with no seasons particularly, right? There's, mm -hmm. It kind of ma it kind of masks the passing of time. It's easy to forget how how much time has passed when when you don't have distinct seasons, presumably. Yes, yeah. Mm. Um, I've also put class on there, not for the like, Marxian reading of it, but um, that there's 
definitive roles that people fulfill. And it's only when they start straying from those roles that they fulfill best that everything starts to collapse. Um, the, the other, the only other element that, that is mentioned when it comes to class is we had a bit of a back and forth before about whether or not um, they all come from the same background. I, the way I read it, it right? the, the way I read it is that the choir are of a higher class than the rest of the kids. Piggy in particular is kind of written in a Cockney dialect and uh, Ralph is well, I think, but, but definitely the choir are the, are the most well-spoken of, of the lot. Yeah, Piggy's uh, grammar really jumps out. And it's different. Yeah, it's also his like abbreviations that, that are kind of place him in as a Londoner. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there anything else that anyone wants to cover on the themes, or do we want to <laughs> move on to the interpretations that we have? Well, one theme that uh, is echoed in the uh, uh, the overall story that doesn't really get touched on a lot is the the similarity between the final hunt and the job of the sailor that comes and rescues them at the end hmm. uh, in that he is also wearing a uniform and part of a, a group of people who are hunting people who are wearing different uniforms. So yeah. there's, there's the exact parallel between the hunt of Jack's group hunting Ralph and this sailor hunting of uh, whoever the enemy happens to be, which is never actually mentioned in the book. Mm, the, the sailor has these, uh, has presumably, you know, he has a lot of rules, doesn't he? And he has a lot of, um, you know, norms and things that his, you know, group stick to. It, it, it's set yeah. during World War II, right? They say when the war ends. Well, it, it's, it's it's described as being an, an atomic war. Oh, okay. Uh, there's only one mention of it, I think, from Piggy, who, who basically says that there was a mention of an atomic war. So I don't think it's yeah. set. It's not a direct um, no like translation for World War II, but it's kind of set. You, you get the impression that that's, that's the era, but it's on a bigger scale, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, you know, war would be another theme that could definitely fit into it. Um, because on on this island, this this conflict that they're having is the highest priority, but obviously the soldier that comes along and sees them think thinks in the grand scheme of things is, is very petty um, in comparison to the, to the outer world conflict that's going on. Um, but it's, it's draws comparisons to the two of them in, in a way that it's like, well, both of them are, are equal one to the children and, and to the man, like they're both, the fight is probably just as it's meaningless between both for, for both people. It's just as petty. Yeah. Yeah. And even though he's got this, he, he's in a more civilized situation, this sailor, um, the war is probably just as meaningless. Yeah. It's yeah. all relevant to your situation, isn't it? it? It's, it's very, very real and very, very serious to mm -hmm. the kids on the Island, but to him, when he lands, it's nothing. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I don't know, some aliens that landed might look at the war that was going on down below and say, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of think the same thing. I mean, their war would seem uh, meaningless to him. I think finding the bunch of kids on the island, you know, that would be meaningful to anybody, like, you know, really, especially they're from your same ethnic group. And, you know, you find some presumably lost kids. That's significant. But you would dismiss, uh, well, until you find out that they're, you know, <laughs> killing each other. That, yeah, but, yeah. You just think they were having a game, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. if, if, if you didn't really think about it, you just got there. You'd think, oh, look at these kids playing, playing you know, yeah. cowboys and Indians, whatever. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to the interpretations. Let's have this is uh, where it goes the most wacky. <laughs> Some of them have uh, a lot more credence than others. The one that. Well, the, the two that I think are at the top, <clears throat> um, the comparison to whether or not they are in either hell, heaven, or purgatory. I think out of the three, I'd, I'd lean towards purgatory. Um, mm -hmm. 
But what do people think? Is there any indications that it might be post-death already? Well, it has the potential to be heaven, doesn't it? And they kind of turn it into mm -hmm. not. Like they're already dead? And... <laughs> well, yes. Maybe, you know, it, it's um, a bit more of a metaphorical purgatory like 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 i said has the potential to be heaven i mean ultimately in the grand scheme of things they've got like a, a re they've got drinking water in, in abundance they have fruit everywhere mm -hmm. uh, they have even though it's difficult for them they could actually make it an island paradise but it, it yeah the happen. island being a, an idyllic paradise is one of the least uh least likely <laughs> situations i can take from the book it's it just makes no sense yeah Pigs, well, fruit, water. <laughs> what more do you need? Basically, uh, the, the beast is something of their own invention. So they, the, the island did not contain the beasts inherently. They they just assigned that that to it. So you could see that they kind of landed in the Garden of Eden. But okay, you, you can survive here quite comfortably. Uh, but they 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 did turn it into their own personal hell. Mm. Yes, yeah. This this is the thing with these interpretations. I, I, I spent a little while looking through them because some of them are quite fun. And with allegorical text, you always get people throwing wacky ideas out. Some of them have a bit more credence than others. <laughs> um, what about the um, the one I haven't listed down here? But um, the, the idea of representation of of romantic uh, notion in in Jack, the empiric notion. Um, through Ralph and the rationalist and Piggy, where they all kind of embody this worldview. Each of them have this one perspective that they embody. They yeah. don't do a very good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to see which one, the one that wins out, you know, the rationalist doesn't win out. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's with... primarily because they're all mono dimensional representations of those they're, they're just sketches they're, they don't they're not fully fleshed out mm -hmm. <clears throat> no I, agree. I mean a rationalist who was unable to actually translate the rational into objective being wouldn't be able to call himself a rationalist and that's pretty much exactly what piggy is and from jack's perspective he's a rationalist isn't he you know you know, it's rational to want food. Protection. You know, and protection, yeah. I don't think it was Golding's, uh, Golding's intention to uh, write a story about uh, these kind of abstractions. I think he wanted to write a story about about how people interact. Uh, yeah, more grounded. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, any, any really, you know, full-fledged work of art lends itself to a, a few different layers of interpretation um some of which may be kind of unconsciously playing out right mm -hmm. well on that topic the final one that we'll touch on is is whether or not it's uh, <laughs> the freudian uh, notion of the id the ego and the superego mm. kind of i think that that's that's mm. biggie is kind of the, the super ego um Jack, oh. maybe um, what's it? Roger is is the it, and then Ralph is trying to, as the ego, trying to find a balance between those two, and fails. So, and then everything goes he goes insane, which is then could be the big fire on the island, maybe. I would certainly agree that all three of them would uh, collectively make a better, solid, well-rounded character than any of them individually. Uh -huh. I think it's important that we end up with Ralph's perspective at the end, like it's fully focused on Ralph at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. And, and that gives more credence to the idea of Ralph as the ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he's, he's the main, I think, the main character in the story. He does yeah, have yeah, a lot of I was just saying, I thought that was Pe Piggy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it always it, it, in every book that I read, there's always one character I, that I do kind of feel like, oh, it'd be great to read a book purely from this person's perspective. <laughs> and as much as I dislike him, I would read a, a piggy-based book <laughs> just to get I think into Jack his mind. Jack as well. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Jack, Jack would be a fascinating one. To would be good. Okay, I know I said the last one was the, was was the one to finish off on, but I have got a picture on there, so I do want to ask. Uh, what about it being used as an, an analogy for uh, you know world powers post World War Two or during World War Two? So the main figureheads, uh, you know, maybe uh, one representing uh, communism, one representing uh, Western democracy, and another. Yeah, I think I'm not sure who would represent who really, because you could say that <clears throat> it works with two was... people. Jack, Jack you... takes away private property, so that would make him the communist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd, you'd have you'd have Jack as the uh, as the mid-century German uh, <laughs> figurehead. Um, you could definitely put Ralph as being the, you know, the more Western democracy, but then that leaves Piggy as as being a communist. I don't really see that working, unless you look at him as just being a the bureaucrat, like, a, he's like definitely a Mao. The mid-level, yeah, he's definitely the bureaucrat, isn't he? He's, it, it, it wouldn't fit because Piggy doesn't have any power. He's not. He's yeah. not. A, he's not. Not somebody who's in control. He's. He's at most second rank. That he's an advisor to the leader, but he's never the leader. So that doesn't map onto any any one of the, those three people who are in the picture. Churchill, That's a good point. Michael. Most of the interpretations have it being as a trifecta, but it, 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 actually, Piggy is there, but he's not a main power source. So you can't really have that <laughs> that that uh, trio idea because he, he's, if, he's pretty useless. And if Ralph wasn't uh, as kind of almost like as feeble-minded as he is, then. Uh, Ralph uh, Piggy would have no, you know, power at all because obviously Jack completely disregards anything Piggy does or says, mm -hmm. and just sees Piggy as a pair of glasses on legs. You know, <laughs> it's clear that he's Golden objectifying Golden... Piggy. <laughs> it's clear that Golding... he's objectifying his glasses. <laughs> Sorry, Golding is chewing over problems of governance raised during the war World World War Two for sure. Yes. And what's best done in the book is that there's no real answer. It, yeah. it pokes holes in everything. And then he basically he brushes his hands off and, <laughs> and leaves. I'd say trying to map it on to uh, like a political, you know, a war of like different types of governance is a bit of a stretch. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, I've listened to, to a couple of interviews with Golding and he, you know, I think that sums him up very well, actually. Like, he's prone to seeing the issues and things, but isn't he doesn't quickly supply an answer because he realizes that uh, these are very complex issues, and he doesn't want to just give one um, one solution that without thinking it through. This, he's not endorsing anything, that's for sure. No, he's yeah, he's just underscoring how difficult it is given our nature. To, to govern wisely. Yes. Okay. So let's finish off on the critical response. So we've covered most of them about the uh, lack of diversity. Um, you disregard the feminists. Fine. Yeah. I don't think <laughs> of valid criticism at all. The, uh, and the other main criticism is uh, is that it's not realistic because there was a situation. All of these are just completely pointless. <laughs> There's a situation in which there were a group of, of boys stranded on an island and they managed to survive and build up a little colony and, and blah, blah, blah. I, it's, it's just such a, a... There's no value to this argument because, it, yes, it happened once, but it, my argument back is look at, like, roof Koreans. <laughs> they didn't just <laughs> appear out of nowhere. This is human nature we're talking about. And, yes, you can find one or two examples of things going very well for people when, when they're put in a bad place, but a lot of the times it devolves into chaos. Or... Yeah, and you could say that it was an accelerated timeline as well, like the boys in the, you know, the story are on about, you know, they might have been all farewell and good, but if you'd have left it you know, on a long enough timeline, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what's the quote if any on a long enough timeline? You know? Also, they were much older. Yeah, they were like eighteen, nineteen. So. Uh, does anyone that, have that, any? Oh, sorry, Karen. I was just going to say that goes back to one of my my core uh, criticisms of the book is none of these kids seem to be particularly well reared uh, with solid values or you know the ability to look past tomorrow. They seem to be very immature. But that's children. Well, 
It's almost like a kit. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to ask if people have any other criticisms of the book that they can think of, because to me, I mean, I didn't actually answer the the Desert Island book question last episode, I don't think, and and this is this is pretty high up there. I've I really I think this is you know top tier uh, literature. Okay. Mm, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, it's beautifully written, very engaging. So I think uh, it's probably unneeded, but I will ask, does, does everyone recommend that people go and read this? Well, I, I, given the fact that I've only read one other book in my life, which is Frankenstein, I would say I would recommend this one over there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do like a organize Rankings. every time we do an episode. Yeah, every time we do an episode, do a ranking of where we put everything. <laughs> Yeah, this one is uh, a lot more enjoyable to read. The characters are much more believable. Uh, it's written in a more pleasant way. Uh, it's surprisingly and... short. Yeah. So. But yeah, compared so... with the last book we did, it, it's just, I, I struggled. You know, Frankenstein, as good as it was, I mean, I don't know. It was, it was a slog, just a wasn't bit, it? It was a slog, yeah. And it was short as well. It was about roughly the same length, aren't it? Yeah, no, I think Frankenstein so, is ten pages longer. Um, yeah, when you get reading it, like a thousand pages it's only about longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you can fly through this. Okay, let, let me look up the word count. But uh... well, Frankenstein had a lot of descriptive prose that was yes. not present in Lord of the Flies. Lord of the no. Flies was much more uh, plot centric and, and admittedly driven. You can't. You've got to let it off the hook for that because it was a convention at the time. Uh, uh, undoubtedly. However, it doesn't mean it's enjoyable to read sometimes. Mm. Um, I'll let the, uh, the word count. <laughs> uh, the word count for uh, Lord of the Flies is uh, almost 60,000, and for Frankenstein, it's slightly over 75,000, so it is longer. Oh, wow. Okay. Obviously almost 20% longer. Yeah. But it felt significantly longer. Obviously, the text is uh, just short and smaller in that book right uh, any other final comments before we finish off go read this book <laughs> that's what I like to hear go read this book yeah. buy my course I hope <laughs> hit the bell icon I hope kids keep reading that this you know this book along with the books by Orwell and things that you know have been on reading lists for a while but I suspect that they're going to be stripped away for assorted reasons and with well, the socialist teachers commenting on it then it's, it's uh, I don't know which mm -hmm. way they take it yeah well this yeah. just shows you how terrible civilization is yeah. Not the how oppressed were these children to be in we, we must rebuild it and impose a new society upon men where everybody can be happy yeah why didn't they you build back better he's held. <laughs> they should have they should have built back better that's what they did that's exactly what happened <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was more economic the, the new society so it was easier to maintain <laughs> and once you've uh, smashed piggy's head on some rocks you know you've got some room for new people it was just in the way of utopia there was definitely a reset. But, <laughs> right before this devolves anymore, <laughs> I'm gonna uh, we're, we're gonna finish off. Right, so our next book is going to be Christmas Carol. Uh, we're going to be streaming that on the 13th of December at 5 p.m. GMT. Um, if you have any other book suggestions or any comments that you want to make about what we've discussed, feel free to <clears> pop them <throat> down. Uh, but other than that, I think I think we'll conclude the episode. Look forward to it. All right. Thanks Bye. a lot, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.